Dana Denha here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Ann Arbor's annual film festival celebrates arts and artists of mediums of all kinds. Obviously, films are a major highlight of the six-day arts extravaganza, but organizers also strive to make it an interactive experience. Joining me is Joel Swanson, an artist that honors how fragile life is and how it affects who we are during our time on Earth, with an installation that delves into the character of its subjects on display at the 2023 Ann Arbor Film Festival. Welcome to the show, Joel. Thank you very much. So the first thing I always like to talk to people about, because it's always a unique sort of situation, is your schooling and background and what sort of led you to being an artist? I have had a dual life. Uh, and uh, initially, when I was in college, I spent summers as a portrait artist, drawing portraits on the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore. And at the same time, I was studying biology. Uh, and then I continued my biology studies and put the art on hold for a while. Um, and I'm now a professor at the University of Michigan studying cell biology. And I make videos of cells in the microscope. But um, uh, in recent years, I've decided to try to dust off my portrait skills. Uh, and I had um, uh, thought of asking someone to sit long enough for me to remember how to make a portrait and I thought that would be just not fair to anyone. So I came up with an idea of recording people posing for their portraits and um, that, that could be displayed uh, at life size on a monitor so that I could paint from life or as close to life without asking someone to sit for more than 50, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, because there is more to uh, a sitting uh, when someone is posing, there's more to the live model than you can get with a photograph, uh, a still photograph. And so um, it's always been important to me since I started this um, to make portraits to try to work from the live model. And so this was a way to approximate that. Um, but it turned out that these videos that I made kept took on a life of their own. And uh, now there, there is a, um, a kind of portrait that I do now, these video portraits that are compelling in their own way uh, beyond what you would get from a painted portrait. And so I'm, uh, I'm trying to develop that idea. How is your work, uh, you talk about being a microbiologist and working at the University of Michigan, how does that affect what your art is now that you're making. I I went back to biology after going to art school for a little while and after being on the boardwalk uh, doing the portraits because I was frustrated by the subject matters of painted art uh, and, and the arts. And so I thought, well, I'm going to just spend my time trying to figure out what it means to be alive, just vitality itself. And so I um, devoted a career to uh, immunology and cell biology. Um, and you can't make uh, get a grant to try to figure out what it means to be alive, but you can keep that question in the background while you answer slightly more medically relevant questions. Um, and that's what I've tried to do. Uh, and now, as I am trying to revive these painting skills, these visual art skills that are separate from what's happening in the microscope, I have been making a lot of abstract uh, art that plays on the concepts of being alive that I've um, learned over the years uh, as a biologist. And so now I make paintings that are um, uh, lately mostly Celtic weave patterns that are kind of um, uh, just a, a design on this on the, on the canvas, but the thought is that um, they allow a, they allow me to create a flat space uh, to work on a flat space in a flat subject matter uh, and play by the rules of biology of biology that I've learned, which are um, uh, being a long ways from equilibrium, being slightly in unfinished, but you can see see the the shape uh in the you can see, you can recognize what the pattern is even though it looks incomplete and so it comes from the idea of 
seeing in children the knowing as you look at a child that that child will eventually be an adult and was once a baby uh, and those that continuum sort of is in the uh, is there when you look at them uh, and so that's what I'm trying to create in this abstract is something where the viewer recognizes where this thing would would go if you walked away and came back later and it was really alive uh, and maybe where it came from. And so the images are uh, of uh, stable forms that are clearly headed in another knowable direction. So that's the abstract stuff. But the portraits have always fascinated me and that I've always wanted to, or I always, for many years, I've wanted to um, uh, make portraits that, like the great famous portrait artists, have a certain vitality to them. And I love to look at the classic portraits uh, if, um, and and even um, uh, experimental portraiture to, to see how artists capture the vitality of the person of the sitter. Um, and I cannot reconcile right now the abs the ideas about abstract art and the ideas about portraiture, but uh, I I love sort of pushing them in both directions, and so I work very hard to make painted portraits that look alive, uh, look like a recognizable live thing, even if it's not a, uh, a strict rendition or um, uh, representation. Um, and so that's what that is. But these video portraits have taken on their own life. Um, so the idea is, original idea was to get a good uh, camera that could take 4K video and to uh, record portraits of sitters that would last 10 to 15 minutes. And then, and then that would be a portrait. Um, that has morphed into uh, sittings now where I've turned the camera sideways so that it records a portrait in portrait mode and is displayed on a 55 inch 4k TV turned sideways, um, uh, which gives it a slightly, a uh, cell phone look to it. But, um, uh, and most recently I've, uh, been using a box that my brother, Walt, who's a furniture maker, um, has built for me that my sitters can climb into and uh, pose from inside there. And what that allows me to create uh, from these recordings is a 55 inch TV that's mounted on a stand, pretty much putting the model at eye level uh, in which the, the person seems to be stuck in the TV. This box is, is, um, about three feet deep, and it's as wide as the TV is high. That is, it's about 27 inches wide and 48 inches high. And that's a box, that's the opening of the box that the person sits inside. And we designed the walls of the box and the floor and the ceiling of the box so that they they recede back uh, away. And so the when the camera is on a tripod, the lines of parallax from the the video from the camera um, create a, a virtual space in which the model is stuck in the box or stuck in the TV. And what what that ends up creating when it's played on a TV, either on, on a stand, as it will be at the Ann Arbor Film Festival, or mounted on a wall, is the appearance that someone's in the box looking at you. The model's instructions are not to hold perfectly still, but to be but to not talk, sit in the box and just not talk um, and just look at the camera. And I've been, I, the first the thing that struck me first about these portraits, other than their obvious presence, uh, is that that simple instruction, don't talk and just look at the camera, ends up leaving room for whole personalities to be revealed in the image that's there. Um, people, just people, the way people fidget or the way their eyes look around or the way they, they think to themselves with their, with, with the movement of their eyes or their, it, it captures quite a lot. It often captures much of the personality in just in a quiet, quiet, uh, setting. And yet 
when it's displayed, it has a presence that's different from classical painted portraits. Of course, it's got the the box that looks sort of like a cell phone screen, but it's large. Uh, and um, and yet, even if someone's just sitting still, the blinking and the breathing and maybe the slight slight movements of the hands or feet um, end up giving it a kind of a spooky quality. Um, uh, and because it's a because the box, the person, the sitter is in the box, they have to, you, you see their whole body. They're, they're, it's not like a, like a, a snapshot where you've got the, you know, clearly it's an image taken from somebody standing there, but you only see them from the waist up. I have those portraits and they are compelling in their own way, but these box portraits have a, uh, an added uh, ingredient that, that gives it a charm, so. How long are these videos when you see them on display? Are they like 20 minutes, 30 10 an hour? To 15, 10 to 15 minutes. Yeah. The one that I'm sure that I'll be showing uh, at the Ann Arbor Film Festival is 15 minutes. Uh, it's a man in a box. My brother Walt, it turns out, sitting in a chair he had made inside this box. Um, and just looking at the camera, clearly, I mean, he decided, having seen a few of these portraits, that he was just going to, think about designing a piece of furniture while he was sitting there. And so you can, he looks a little bit serious in this, in this video, but um, he, it's clearly, um, he, he's in his own thoughts and uh, that. And they, and some of the portraits are only 10 minutes. Uh, I've made, usually when someone sits for a portrait, I make several recordings and work from them. One of the pick, edit them, so. Well, I feel like if you were one of the subject matters, it could feel really uncomfortable just sort of sitting there and being lost in your thoughts while someone's recording you. But someone like Walt has that connection to you. So he might have had like a comfort level that maybe some random stranger may not have had. That's a really good point. And that's partly why I don't just take a bunch of pictures or, or video short videos sitting in a box for 10 minutes eventually allows your mind to wander and you just and you and your personality is revealed and i often edit away the first minute or two of awkwardness that someone has in the box um uh but yeah there is there is uh some of the best portraits that i've gotten from this um this method are of people i know who seem to have confidence and the like. But another method that has worked really well, not for anyone in the box, but for a couple of other portraits I've done, is to play to play a recording of either a story or some uh, some music that the, I know the person loves. And so they can become lost in either the story or the music. Uh, and then then it's a perform it's a magnificent performance of someone, Sort of just feeling the emo strong emotions of a story, uh, and that too is a kind of compelling portrait. So you've done some of these other box portraits with other family members. I have. Um, uh, I have a son uh, who's and who's married, and he and his wife fit in the box uh, for a for a pose, and that's a beautiful portrait um, of that relationship. Uh, and um, I have a daughter who has been alone in the box and she's been in the box with uh, her husband and their baby. And um, those are a different kind of presence. Those are, those could be turned into paint, port, uh, painted portraits, but they, they, they end up being, taking a different aspect of being, uh, of being re recorded this way. The other, uh, the other strength of these portraits, I think, is that I, by insisting that the models be projected at life size, it'll it it takes away the dominance of technology over the portrait, uh, which is another point that I um, try to make these days. So everyone looking at this video and anyone looking at stories on their phone or looking at screen, the big screen uh, in the theater are looking at people who are not at life size and you know they're not at life size. And so just by accepting that those terms of cinema 
and video, we are accepting technology's dominance over people. And so by making life-size portraits and insisting that the only way you see them is in this life-size setting where you can walk up to it, it's a high resolution image and you're gonna get a good image, um, that that then gives uh, some strength to the to the sitter that and to the image of the sitter that uh, I think is lost when you have an image of a person's face that could be magnified, shrunk, moved around and manipulated in what I consider a slightly degrading uh, submission to technology. Well, when you talk about, um, you know, it's sort of being a life-size image, it's on a, it'll be on a stand at the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Is it going to be ground level or will it be raised above? It's raised. So the, um, the bottom of the TV set is about three feet off the ground. And so the whole, and then it goes another four feet. Uh, maybe it's only two feet off the ground and it goes to six feet, something like that. But you, you, you could easily imagine looking at this screen that the box is at that height and somebody's crawled into it and they're looking at you and they're actually, their eyes are following you. So talk about this idea of putting people in a box because it's sort of something that we think about where you do put, I mean, it's like stereotypes. You put people in these boxes. Is that sort of the idea where the box came from? Yes. I think uh, the, the box was a practical solution to getting a portrait that I could fit on a, on a screen and then turn onto a, a canvas of similar dimensions. But as I look at them, they end up being a, a strong metaphor for people in the boxes they put themselves into or that the, the constraints of life that are the box you're born into in various ways. And so you can, you have in this, um, in this setting, um, kind of a, a, a metaphorical image of life, of the constraints of life. And that, um, that's part of why I like pushing this idea is that um, uh, people of different different stripes, different colors, different genders and everything um, can be in the box, but they are by sitting in a box, sort of sort of obviously confined by those constraints. And it ends up, um, uh, forcing them to reveal more of their other aspects of their personality. And discuss this, uh, you know, you want to use like the best technology that we have at the moment. You're talking 4K OLEDs and why that realism is so important in this project. The... Uh, again, again, the idea is to get the technology to allow me to get as close to a live person again uh, as possible. Um, and that the, the 4K TV mounted sideways where the whole body fits in the TV set um, uh, allows me to do that. I have I use various editing software to to um, uh, play with the quality of the image. Um, but I don't edit with strong cuts or anything. You know, it's a pretty, it's a continuous image. The beginning of the video fades in from an empty box very often, uh, and then fades out at the end. So it does provide a beginning and an end of sort of a, a, a ghost that comes and goes, um, uh, Yeah, so the technology is just the best I could come up with to 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 do this. I I took a short course at the New York Film Academy in the fall of 2018 and learned the basics of camera work and editing and the like, and that was very helpful in, in just for lighting and and the rest. Um, but um, that's about all I've done on film, other than the kind of editing and, and the like that I do in my lab. You know, you talk about your life's work and this dedication to sort of how life is a fragile thing. And 
learning more about the human body and sort of studying it with your art. Why do you feel like this has been such a strong thought process in your heart and mind for basically your entire career? Um, when I had finished college and I had been a portrait artist uh, for a few for summers and was about to go off and either be a, an artist or a scientist, I was uh, I spent a lot of time going to museums and to art and um, was think was fascinated then at the the quality of art of the the paintings and art images that I most liked as having a certain vitality to them. That is, I, I, um, I remember being at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia one day, turned a corner and saw a Toulouse-Lautrec painting that just uh, punched me in the chest. Uh, and I thought, now that if that's alive, I mean, there, there was a certain vitality to that experience. And of course, that's not what I'm looking for in biology, but that's what showed up or that's what I, I sensed there's and then I thought well somehow I'd like to reconcile this kind of vitality of being that you see in the arts in the, in dance and in various perform um, live art and film and the like uh, and the rule and reconcile that with the rules of being alive just chemistry that's a long ways from equilibrium and it's doing interesting things because it's not quite at weak equilibrium and everything's designed to run on, you know, sugar that keeps it away from equilibrium. So that's the, that's, I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's what drove, that's what's guided this exploration. And it's still an exploration. You talk about it, your people in boxes installation and how it sort of makes you see deeper into the person, their character and stuff. Do you find that to be true too when you're creating your painting, your painted portraits? And do you foresee, you know, using some of these videos of the people in boxes and making painted portraits as well? I do. That was the original plan. I've only made, well, I've made uh, maybe half a dozen of painted portraits from them only one of a painting of a person person's whole body in the box i should share that but um uh that was a, a portrait of someone who sat in the box for um two or three 10 minute sessions once with a chair and once without a chair it's it's very awkward in that space if you're just <laughs> in there alone uh, but um to make the paintings from these portraits uh, I do select a frame that I like as a as a frame that reveals that's revealing of what I've picked up from the video, uh, and I'll use that to make the painting. But I will, as the painting begins to take form, uh, acceptable form, um, I will then spend a fair amount of time just watching the video and looking for aspects of the portrait of the person that would in make the portrait seem both more like them and more alive. Um, so just, you know, the little turns of the head and things like that, that, that um, only show up in the video or in live portraits uh, end up informing the final painted portrait quite a lot. So. You were an artist first and then you became a scientist. Uh, were you continuing your art throughout your career? Or was this something that you came back to later? Um. I have always made stuff. Um, it's I would, my dad was an art teacher, and and he just encouraged us to do paper mache and clay and silkscreen and drawing, and the like. And there, and I think uh, I like my brothers and um, many of the people in my family. I've always tried to uh, just keep keep ideas moving along in various forms of expression, either by making whimsical things or drawing out ideas for experiments or drawing out concepts for what things could be like. So it's always been notes uh, and, and paintings at some, to some level, but um, uh, I've, I'm becoming more focused on that uh, um, now. Talk about the importance of putting yourself out there as an artist, maybe even speaking to like some of the younger generations that want to pursue a career in the arts or even as a hobby, 
But like, you know, like you said, I didn't, you were like, you know, I want to be a part of the Edinburgh Film Festival. I'm just going to try it. Or you've been a part of Ipsy Glow and different things around this area. Um, I get a lot of, uh, I think it's important for people who are, who love the arts and people who, for everyone to encourage other people to express themselves in various ways. And I'm lucky in that many of the really extraordinary artists in this town who organize things like Ipsy Glow and um, uh, Festa Fools and the like, Mark Tucker, Jerry Rosenberg, um, are uh, have continually encouraged me over the years to go ahead and try stuff and to to make things and to show them see what happens uh and uh so that's been a great support for me and i have done what i can to encourage um young people i interact with to to try to draw or you know put art in their keep art in their life um much like my my family has always done so well, before we go, why don't you tell people why they should, you know, come to the Ann Arbor Art, our Ann Arbor Film Festival, check out all the different art, visit off the screens, and just support the f festival in any way that they can. Ann Arbor is, as a as a city, is a rich place to appreciate the arts, and the Ann Arbor Film Festival is one of the best expressions of artistic expression that's here in here in town. Um, seeing art like we have at the Ann Arbor Film Festival and in off the screen uh, activities just has the has the beauty of surprising you. Uh, it has it, it, there's there's very little that surprises us in life. And so art can do that without hurting us, <laughs> without getting hurt. And so there's just this real um, richness that can come from uh, seeing the arts, experiencing the arts. And the Ann Arbor Film Festival uh, is one of the great expressions of that here in town. Well, I want to thank you, Joel, for being a guest on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for your good questions and your interest. To watch this and other CTN series, visit youtube.com slash CTN Ann Arbor. And remember to like, subscribe, and share. I'm Dana Denha for a Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival.